Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep. It's time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, success. These are the things that we love. It They drive us. They inspire us. It's why we get out of bed in the morning and I get to talk to a drum hero. I'm talking a childhood drum hero. This is such a special day. Hailing originally from Vancouver, Canada, and since 1979 has been a founding member of an award winning, we're talking selling platinum records. Our friend, Matt Frenette. What's up, Matt? How are you, man? Hey, man. I'm, I'm good. Matt Just, Frenette of Loverboy with us right now, man. Where are you right now, buddy? I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, yeah and you learned how to pronounce it, R Raleigh. You can't say yeah. rally. Not rally. <laughs> yeah, man. So um, I we were just talking off camera and uh, we were smart enough not to waste some of this good juice that happens when we're just getting to know each other. But I saw you at the El Paso Coliseum. The year was 1985 and it was a headlining tour and the Hooters were opening up for you. And of course, We've had our I had my our mutual friend David Wasikin and of the Hooters on the show. I think they're celebrating forty plus years as a band together, and I think it's a similar story for you guys in Lover Boy. Do you remember yeah. that show? I really do, and I remember that tour really vividly. And <clears throat> I had this vintage drum collector out in Connecticut, and I laid a drum on. David, at the end of the tour, one of my old, it was like an old Slingerland or something from way back, like the 50s or late 40s. It was just a gift, you know, because we all really bonded really well and we did amazing business. And um, yeah, that would have been the Love and Every Minute of It tour. It could have been in 84, but maybe it was 85. You're, you're saying 85. Seem you're, like you're you're saying eighty five. <laughs> I, I I think I think it probably was because I feel like I was a sophomore in uh in high school and I was really into both the bands and it and it's a memorable show because I think you put your right foot through the bass drum head. Oh my god! And, and your tech came out that I mean, night and was trying to make yeah, things. Yeah, yeah and and <laughs> you would have only noticed that. So probably what happened is the felt beater came off the top of the whatever Pedal. whatever pedals I was using at the time. And was it was it double bass or single bass on the big maple kit? Um, it, I think you just had a single kit, man. Yeah. So I might have been playing uh, hard to say back when it was double kick. It was two Ludwigs and then the, the felt beater, the little nut on the top would come off. And then, you know, the shaft would go right through the head and slice it like a knife. Yeah. And then we'd have to, like, rather than tear it stopping and everything, we'd have to stop for, like, a small break. And Reno would tell some jokes and stuff. And then we'd have to put, like, a gaffer tape patch on. Yeah. That's what I, always, that's what I always, would always say. Tell him a joke, Aldine. Like, back in the day, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, and we're using the flam slams and stuff on the kick because, you know, I'm, I bury the beater. I think you would probably, I assume you would bury the beater or do you pull off the head? Yeah. Yeah. You pull but off? I, 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 I play on my, on my pads and my, on my feet. I don't play heel down. So. Yeah. So heel up, boom, going through that going. And so you're just playing with fire and as a boy scout in a slightly, not like Howie Mandel level, but a slightly OCD person. I that immediately said to myself, "Oh my God, this is going to happen to you at some point. You got to be ready. You got to have an extra head. You got to have gaff tape. You got to have, you know what I mean." And that makes us like a Boy Scout in the sense that even if we have a drum tech, we got to have that second snare drum there. Oh, we got to have that extra. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And what we used to do is my drum tech back in the, those days, we had like a cut, like a mylar like just a, either a square or a circle from a snare head or whatever, single ply, double ply, and that would go over the over the break and then gaffer tape that. And that would last the whole show, hopefully. Pretty much the rest of the set, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so have you had a, a, a 
one drum tech your entire career or no <clears throat> it's been multiple techs yeah um i started out when we started out warming up we, we toured canada in 80 because the first album came out in 1980 yeah we recorded early part of the year like february and then we started touring and our first tour as support was cheap trick in in western canada back in 80 but and then turn me loose hit really big on the fm wave especially back east like montreal everybody in new york and and was hearing it and you know toronto was playing it on um montreal was shom fm c-h-o-m and people were calling their local radio stations across the in northern new york state and calling their record uh, radio stations and the the program director was going well we don't have this lover boy you know and they're going oh you gotta play tear me loose it's this cool song so that's kind of how we broke into the states yeah and so the the program directors in in detroit that we're hearing from toronto and missoula montana south of calgary and minneapolis south of winnipeg and northern washington like bellingham and stuff like that we're hearing it from vancouver you know just all the canadian because all the main canadian cities are along this the border right. along the railway track that they developed canada on from east to west yeah so so the program directors called cbs records did did their homework and cbs in new york called management Bruce Allen in Vancouver. And uh, so, <laughs> so that all of a sudden we were like going to America, going to New York at the yeah. CBS built tower in, in, in Manhattan, you know, it was like ah! the big city. Yeah. Big city, like way bigger, more people in New York city than all of Canada, you know, at the time, which so, is crazy, which is crazy. You know what? Well, I have never had a bad time in Canada. The, it, there is the stereotypes for a reason because it's the truth. I have never had a bad time with a Canadian person. Always. Hey, you want watch the moose? Let's get get me in a little bat. I mean, it's great. I mean, it's and it, they're always so friendly. Yeah. Uh, and, and and something tells me you're 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 stereotypical because you got a big smile on your face and all that kind. But uh, doesn't it, this is a fun. real thrill to sit with you because um, you're such a musical player and great drum parts, a lot of passion, a lot of fire and just the right part at the right time. Great showman. And of course, I'm a child of MTV and you guys were fortunate at the time. J.J. Jackson, Nina Blackwood, Martha Quinn, uh, Alan Hunter bringing music 24 seven into into the living rooms and, and and i think where a lot of people were probably like this will never work right it worked yeah, for that's about when 16 the roller years got really fast in 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 81 that mtv hit um american television in august of 81 yeah so we started in 81 supporting um kansas then zz on mad mechanic tour for the summer and then journey after ZZ and somewhere in there, we went and demoed tracks for the get lucky album <clears throat> at mushroom studios in Vancouver. Yeah. And, um, you know, just like 16 track <clears throat> and a different studio, not at little mountain with Bob rock and all that stuff. So, and anyway, so, you asked me about drum tech. So I had a different oh, yeah. tech in Canada. I'm just looping back because I just, you know, you got I real. Have, I have ADD too, my friend. Me in. So yep. then I got, I had that same tech at the beginning of 81. And then I met Steve Smith and all the Journey guys. Yeah. And his drum tech was Lauren Wheaton. That's right. From Toronto. Yeah, we're Facebook friends. <laughs> <laughs> and um so he joined with me in 82 when the jet started taking off really fast right and and and, and the get lucky album came out working for the weekend hit and really fast and um 
So we started headlining in America and Canada in 82. And we went to Japan in the fall for just under a month in 82. Wow. You know, so this, this, when I think about it, like the first six years of the eighties were insane for you guys. Album after album. It seems like it was 80, maybe 81 or 82. It's like there was like an album a year, a cycle. And for the band to have been formed in 79, so you're, you're kicking around, you quickly get a record deal. Then you're opening up for folks for maybe a year and a half, maybe two years. MTV helps things along. Then you're headlining. So you're a band for about three years and then you're headlining arenas. That yeah, you didn't have a lot of time to write materials. That's I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, yeah, yeah. You no. Know, and that was the tough thing is the guys are writing. The main writers are trying to write on the road and in hotel rooms on on or on buses going down the road. So management put us into a into a jet um in 82 just so we would have a little more time and less time on the bus oh yeah but they were like p.s you owe us all this money back for renting the jets and all the fuel and that wine that you've been sipping on oh you owe us for that i don't know but maybe there's a story there yeah (laughs) (laughs) not Uh, one i'm gonna tell on the podcast nah nah no we we can gather um, but that happens fast. I mean, that is amazing. And then it's got to be an amazing feeling to say to yourself, wow, I achieved my childhood dreams before my 20s were over. I was a rock star and I get to travel the highways and byways of the world with some of my best friends and we impact pop culture for all time. So that's got to be an amazing feeling. You hit the nail on the head, Rich. Yeah. And- yeah, we were all really close friends and, you know, we still have four out of five original members yeah. and only because we lost Scott, um, who was lost at sea in um, 2000 in November wow. sailing down the West Coast. And he was swept overboard and never, never discovered, never, never recovered. I am so sorry. That is so sad. Yeah. And um, otherwise, we'd probably be one of the very only bands all running on full cylinders 40 know, years later of, of exactly of that era you know it, it, it is pretty rare um you know what talking to talking to david from the hooters he's like hey man we're on like year 41 or 40 you know like i said to myself oh my god i've been playing with the guys in my band for 25 years man and it happens so fast and you finish each, each other's sentences. And in the early days, you go through different periods and chapters. Like in the early days, we had, we were full of piss and vinegar and we had something to prove. And we were like a motorcycle gang, big wallet chains coming into your town. You know, it was like the Bob Seger song, you know, and and uh, and then, you know, the hits start to happen. And you're like, oh, let's do the craft work thing and do like ties red ties with black shirts and the next thing you know you're wearing the the blazer with the rock tee and then everyone starts to buy houses and have families and you go through these chapters but you're still together it's amazing yeah you know everybody's been pulling in the same direction for decades and decades you know and god bless mike and paul and Doug for writing all of this incredible material that people still want to hear. We're yeah. very, very, very blessed. And we think we count our blessings every year we go out and we have another big, huge year planned this year. Right. I mean, we had two years of, of down during COVID because the borders were closed from Canada to the U S and Mike and Paul and Doug are still in Vancouver. And, um, <clears throat> we, in March of 2020, we did three shows in January, and that was it. And then we had this cruise, this 80s cruise theme. It would have been our second cruise planned for the first week of March out of Fort Lauderdale or Miami or something like that, a whole bunch of different bands and you know 80s groups and the first one we went on, you mentioned MTV VJs, and the first one we went on in 2018 or 19, 
was all the MTV VJs, the re the remaining VJs. Yeah. And it was amazing um, seeing them all again and reminiscing and the whole boat was like outfitted like 80s and Pac-Man and Mario Brothers and <laughs> all that in television. Rubik's and Cubes, ALFs. Yep, yep. It was just really themed. Yeah. And th that was great. And so what happened in, in 2020 is we were going to go out and then COVID kind of hit. And we all had a, a, a conference call because I was still in Raleigh with, with the management and band. And we decided to pull the plug. Yeah. And Brett Michaels was the other headliner on that cruise in 2020. And... Um, he pulled just after us as well. And that ship still went out, you know, um, did all the Caribbean and everything. And they just put some other bands on there, cool in the gang and went with a seventies theme and all that. And they got COVID on that boat and they were, they were not allowed to port back in Southern Florida for three weeks. Oh my God. Then the dysentery breaks out and then, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, because I was going to ask you what and scurvy. <laughs> yes. What? How was I? I always like to say, like, if I haven't seen people in like two, three years, I'd be like, "How was your COVID?" You know, it's just kind of like an icebreaker. Like, uh, you know, yeah. how did you spend your time? We did. Did you get? Did you get to practice? Did you read books? Did you? Did you bake sourdough? Did you? Did you take up art? What'd you do? Well, I walked a lot. And so um, obviously, income was was uh, scaled down considerably. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did get to practice. And I managed at the old drum shop here called 2112. Yeah, I've done um, a clinic there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the last time I saw a clinic there was, was Todd. Yeah. Uh, Zipper Nice. And um, he did one just last fall. And I went to see him, obviously, from the tour we did that we got to know each other really well in 2022 with REO and Sticks. Oh, uh, yeah. For four months. And that was incredible. Yeah. And what an incredible person and, and drummer he is. Oh, my gosh. Top and notch. it was lined up down the block to get in there. And of course, I snuck in the door. You know, they went, come on, Maddie, just, just come in the back in. door. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and it was like, oh man, there was like, I don't even know how they made room for everybody to get in there. And Matt just paused just a little bit. Maybe the Wi Fi is a little strange. There you go. You're back, buddy. We lost you for okay. a second. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the screen freeze a little bit. No worries. It says my internet connection is unstable. Well, I you know, we are drummers. Of course it's unstable. Uh, get, a, get a splash. Somebody get the splash. Um, yeah, man. So so that's the thing. It was just COVID. It was like, you know, you said you walked a lot. I Yeah, I, I, I got to practice at the old 2112 location down in, the, in their stock room. Yeah. And I brought my touring kit out from 2017, my Yamaha kit. Uh, hybrids and set that the whole kit up like the double bass drum and my touring kit and drove out in a minivan and picked it up with a buddy and drove it all the way back kind of in like two days and our our back line is in uh, basically Fort Wayne Indiana <clears throat> so we went out there and got it so that I could practice during because I'm in an apartment so I can't play real drums here and um, they let me work out for six months. That's great. That's super cool. So I would just put like live, live sets on in my earbuds and just play the whole 90 minutes show. Keep the and, material fresh. Yeah. Yeah. And just go for it, you know, and That's just it. have like a show every day, you know, or when I wanted to go like at least three times a week. And there was all this talk about management saying, um, we might go out in September and we might blah, 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 you know, in 2021. And it never happened. 
because Ariel went out and everybody got sick and Kiss went out and everybody got sick and Tesla went out and everybody got sick. We were just hearing all of this. And so Paul and Mike and Doug, they got really nervous because they're all in uh, humping down in Vancouver, you know, hunkering down and, you know, they're having little chats amongst themselves. So they call me and they go, yeah, we're not going to go out in September because everybody's getting sick out there and we don't want to risk it. Plus the borders are still closed and, yeah. you know, you have to test going out and test coming back and, you know, all this stuff and has to be done 24 hours ahead of time. And it's yeah. such a rigmarole, you know, so we just ended up sitting for pretty much two years. Until 2022. Correct. And then we started doing our own shows in the spring. And our first show was in uh, Pennsylvania at a theater up there somewhere. I don't know, Burgettstown or something like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, we went a day and uh, two days before the show to rehearse, you know, and even though I'd been practicing, you know, playing the gig, as you know, isn't like practicing at all. You yeah. Know? It's just the adrenaline's going, and especially at a, like in a lover boy set, you know, it's just, you know, you can practice all you want, especially the the faster tunes. It's your life and Lady of the Eighties and Weekend and all the fast fast rockers. Yeah. You know, and you got to drop it down for the ballads, you know, and just it, it, it doesn't take the place of of playing live. You're right. In, you're you're in so my right. Opinion. In my well, you, you did the right thing because I always tell my students, I say, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. So you were walking, you were keeping your positive mental attitude, you were running the set, you had the sticks in your hands. So when the call came, guys, the world needs entertainment. We're going back out. You were ready and you were ready yeah. to do it. And you probably just were just, I mean, I remember when I got saw my band, I was like, this is, and we oh, went, back, man. We, yeah. we, we went a year early, you know, I mean, because. Nashville, uh, Tennessee did not really shut down as much as the other parts of the country. It's like, hey, business as usual here. So we ended up going out um, uh, late 2021. And then yeah. by 2022, still felt a little bit weird, but we business was open. We were doing our thing. But man, when you your sense of identity or a, a large portion of it is wrapped around seeing your brothers and playing a musical instrument every day and you don't do it, do, 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 do. It messes with your head a little bit. Yeah, I had a lot of dark days and um, just talking on the phone with with buddies, um, especially my my good buddy Jeff Westhaver up in Boston, mm -hmm. who was with Zildjian for thirty plus years, and we would have these think tanks on the phone, and he'd check in with me like every week, and he'd just go, "How you doing?" And I'm going, ah, "I'm having kind of a blue week," you know, and just. Like exactly what you said, you know, yeah. like the camaraderie of the team and the crew and and making music together. I mean, this is just it's in my DNA. Yes, it is. I've never yeah. even been a paper boy. I've been drumming pretty much my whole life. I started on bongos at five years old. And Play the into, country songs, right? Did I read that somewhere? Where there's country music. Yeah, in you house? did. Yeah. yeah. And I, I started um, my parents rented me a snare drum when I was in like, oh, I don't know grade five and <clears throat> rented it for a year. And then in my grade seven year, my dad was a floor layer and he, um, he was going to work this job and do this flooring. And he took all his supplies and linoleum and his cement and all his blowtorch and his trawls down to the basement. And he saw this sheet hanging over what he imagined was a kid of drums. Yeah. And so he pulled the sheet back and there was this single set of white Marine Pearl drum set. And so dad went and talked to the guy who was there upstairs and he, I guess he was a retired jazz drummer and uh, a big band drummer in Vancouver. Wow. And he ended up cutting a deal for the drums where he just did the bathroom for the set of drums and did all the tile and the linoleum and everything in there. That's a great story. So your dad right away was like, this kid has got it and he wants to do it. And I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. That's and, great. and so he brought the old guy and, and, and I got out of grade seven and came home one day from school, walked across the park 
and the drums were set up in the living room with the old guy and my parents and my kid's sister. And it was in South Vancouver. I don't know what year that would have been. Uh, grade seven, uh, graduated in 72. So go back, what, nine years? Uh, 72. So it'd be like a 64, 63. Yeah. 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 So that was a couple years before the Beatles. Exactly. And so it had Zin symbols, silver symbols, and it, it they were white marine oyster. Um, and they were probably like really rare. And they weren't Pearl. They weren't Tama. They weren't anything like that or Slingerlands. They weren't like a big or WFL. They weren't anything like that. They were just this cool drum set. And dad built me a soundproof room down in the, in the lower basement at, in my bedroom so I could play and drum my heart's content. What a cool dad, man. It, re it reminds me of my dad. My dad was, I think, secretly wanted to be a drummer. And so he was like, you know, he'd crank up the radio and we listened to like Jimi Hendrix or something. And he'd be, and Mitch yeah. Mitchell would be playing and he'd be like, can you yeah. do this? And I was like, well, I hear a lot of paradiddles. And so I'm sure I could do it. And he, and, but he loved the big band drummers, Gene Krupa. And so, yeah, he's so proud. I'm sure your dad was very, very proud. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And both my parents. Yeah. There was a lot of support. And so when I did marching starting in grade eight through grade 10, um, they were involved and it was through the community center, not through the high school. Yeah. And, and Killarney Park was in South Vancouver and we lived right on Killarney Park. So I joined the Killarney Junior Band through the community center and my parents were both involved um, and and would m we were marching in concert. So I learned to read my first sheet music and all that stuff back then. Um, I was just going to ask you, if you read music, I said, something tells me this guy reads music, the way he approaches things and the, the, con the stick control that you have. Um, well, I did back then. Yeah. yeah. That's very kind, Rich. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but I learned a lot from those marching days of stick control and, and <clears throat> the paradiddles and the double stroke rolls and the rolls, press rolls. Yeah. And we had this, it was British band based. It was really, you know, Colonel Bogey on parade, Philip Sousa and all that stuff. Oh, I love me some Sousa, man. Come on. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the horns and the sousaphones and the tubas and the trombones yeah. and the clarinets and the, you know, all the woodwinds and the trumpets Amazing. and all of that stuff. And then four snare drums and a big bass drummer and then a guy playing cymbals, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Amazing. And hey, that's the that's the beautiful thing about the drum set is that one guy does it all, you know? Yeah. He walked by with his little nylon baton under his arm, like all British and everything, and you'd be do pract practicing outside in the rain, rolling on these old Ludwig snare drums that just played terribly at the time anyway, yep. and especially in the rain, oh. you know, and you're trying to roll, do a press roll, and then he would go right across the wrists. And, and it would be just like capital punishment, you know, like, yeah. oh, my God. You know, he says, get, get going, get, do do a finer press roll. And I said, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying and in the rain. It's, it's So was it, was it a, uh, those were calfskin heads back then, yeah? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, only a snare on the bottom. So, you know, <laughs> it almost sounded like a deep tom. With with a little bit of gurgle snare on the bottom, you know they were. Oh, red. I can I can picture that sound. So, fast forward a generation or two, and I'm a march. I was a marching band guy. Four years in high school, four years in college, uh, and we had those gigantic, super deep white Slingerland drums with Ludwig yeah. rocker heads, Dennis DeLucia sticks, and then a strap, not a harness. So all of our, you know, we all walk to the side because of the strap, you know, on our, and you're out yeah, there. We with, had a strap and yeah. then a leg brace that was attached to the drum at the bottom. Yes. And it was metal and it folded up and yeah. you could put the brace across your thigh just to keep it kind of settled from swinging back and like you said like all out of kill <laughs> everybody was supposed to be square and everything 
but it so, paid off. It paid off great, man, because you have the stick control, and then when you have yeah. a mu when you have a musical mind and you can read, it's just to me, it's just the secret to the universe. It's like the whole background, the whole backbone of my teaching philosophy is you gotta read, you know. So when so then you keep developing as a musician. How did Lover Boy come together? Because I'm looking here on the wiki. And you were in a band called Streetheart. Now, isn't Streetheart, if I'm not mistaken, isn't that a a seminal Canadian rite of passage band? Yes. And Paul Dean was in that band, in the original band. Yeah. And the bass player who came in after Scott passed is was in that band and is still a founding member. Gotcha. <clears throat> and out of Winnipeg, Manitoba. But the band was originally founded in Regina, Saskatchewan. I always like saying Regina. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so Paul was in a band before Streetheart with me. He joined a group that I joined out of high school. Like my dad basically pushed me out the door. That's a whole other story. I don't know how much time we have. we got all the time in the world, man. Okay. So... I'll, I'll try and stay on track here. So the great Canadian river race was um, a band that I joined out of high school. And it was a band that had already been together from Penticton, British Columbia in the Okanagan in central BC, really beautiful out there and all yeah. that. And um, <clears throat> kind of resort summer water skiing and fishing and camping and swimming and nice. all of that great stuff and a lot of um, orchards and everything out there. And now it's all a lot of wineries and, and all of that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> that band was from there, but they were playing in Vancouver in 1972. And I had just graduated from high school, grade 12. And I'd only been out of school for a, a couple of weeks. And then um, my dad got a call from a, a, a floor laying buddy. And, and, and this friend of my dad says, hey, Gil, is your kid still playing the drums? And, of course, my old man, knowing Gil, he, he goes, yeah, he's going to be the next Buddy Rich. Yes. Or something like that. Nice. You know, something like uh stop dad you know so he goes why and he says well i'm down here laying floors and doing new tile in the bathrooms at this club called pharaoh's retreat down in gastown in vancouver and during the day and they seem to be auditioning drummers down here and so my dad got a hold of somebody from the club and spoke to this person who ended up being Bruce Allen. Yeah. Who ended up co-managing the band. Yeah. Fast forwarding. So there's this synchronicity going on. So dad sets up a listening session, but in B British Columbia, it's 21 in, in, in the clubs to drink alcohol. So I'm only 18. Uh -huh. So I can't legally be in the club to listen to the band to see if it's something that I would be able to join. Yeah. So we stood in the fire escape, came down from the street, down these set of stairs, and they held the, the fire door open a little bit so I could watch the band while they were playing and caught the end of one set. And then the break was like 15 minutes and we just kind of hung out and then um, <clears throat> heard like half of the second set and then we left and dad had set up on the break. He had gone and talked to the manager of the group who was with them at the time in Vancouver. And so he set up an audition for me on the Saturday, which was the next day. Yeah. So we, we listened to the band. I got to listen to the band on a Friday night and they'd been there for two weeks. So it was at the end of their stint. And uh, so I auditioned and I knew most of, of their set, like Doobie Brothers, all the late seventies, Carol King, James Taylor, you know, Chicago. Yeah. You know, all, all the hit parade stuff. Um, 
and I, and I was drumming to that in my in my soundproof bedroom, you know, Amazing. to record. Yes. You know, <laughs> without headphones, you know, it's like tapping it's along. Trying trying to stay with it, make sure the record wasn't skipping. Exactly. You know, so <laughs> so anyway, so they showed me the set list and they said pick pick five songs that you you know from from our set list. So I picked, I don't know, James Taylor, Carol King tune, Tapestry, Color My, yeah. Color My World by Chicago, nice. and um something else. And you're gonna have to you're gonna have to remember this for your memoir. Exactly. <laughs> so I went up and played, and and the drummer who was leaving because he was getting married, and his wife didn't want him to play in the band anymore from Edmonton. That's like so, a Brian Adams song. Jenny quit. Johnny got married. Yeah, and so he 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 had a set of black fuzzy fives. Wow. So, <laughs> vibes drums are great. Austin, Texas, man, that's crazy yeah, that I'm, yeah. I'm 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 drinking out of my Keep Austin Weird mug today. So exactly. So I had never even seen or heard of vibes, and so I finished the four four or five songs and came back down. And we all had like this little powwow at at one of the tables there and sat with management and then you know the four band got the three band guys. And <clears throat> I don't know if I can say this. It, it's it's a family, sure you can. Oh, it's yeah. It's a family show, right? Oh, okay. no. you can, We can get the X rating. No problem. Okay. So the manager opening question was, have you ever had the clap? What? I'm, I'm, I'm 18 and I just got out of high school, you know? Wow. <laughs> so, excuse what's me? The, what's the clap? Exactly. <laughs> what's the clap? And so they all have a big laugh, and then and then the the, the keyboard player interrupts him because there's like this deadpan air, and I don't know what to even say uh, from that. And then uh, he says, "Do you have a set of drums?" And I said, "Yeah." What color are they? Uh -oh. And I said, "Pink champagne Ludwig, pink champagne sparkled Ludwigs that I." My dad co-signed the loan for in 69. We traded that first drum kit, the white, no names, whatever they were, on the Ludwigs. And um, dad co-signed the loan and all that stuff. So that was the drums that I played at home. And I said, yeah. And he said, they're not black. And I went, no, they're, they're pink sparkled, like pink, pink. And I went, no, they're kind of gold, pink, pinkish gold. That champagne sparkled Ludwig that Mitch Mitchell and 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 um, everybody played. Sure. And um, I can't remember what uh, Michael Shreve from Santana when I saw Woodstock in '69. Oh. He had 17 years old at that on exactly. that gig. Exactly, and I think he was on Pink Champagne Sparkled Ludwigs. Nice. And um, I saw Ginger with Blind Faith in something, and I saw the original Hendrix in 67 in Vancouver with Mitch and he was on pink champagne. That's why I wanted those drums because they were my biggest influences. Heck yeah. So anyway, so these went, Oh, okay. So we're going to talk amongst ourselves. And then I left and they came to a decision and I came back in 20 minutes and they said, you're in. Hey kid, you, you got the gig. Yeah, where do you live? And I said, well, in South Vancouver. I'll write my address down for you. And he said, we'll pick you up tomorrow. Um, and then we're going to drive to Penticton, which is five hours through the mountains to get into the central, into the Okanagan. And you were easily the youngest man in the band, right? You were the young lion. I, I was the same age as the guitar player. We were both born in 54. Yeah. So... He um he didn't finish grade twelve, but the other the bass player who was his brother the guitar player's brother so there was brothers on guitar and bass, and then the keyboard player was was the oldest, um, and Marcus was the oldest. Can't remember the the bass player. They were a couple of years older than me and Selwyn, guitar player. So ironically, 
they had a gig the following weekend. So not only was I trying to learn four or five 45 minute sets of material, a lot. Yeah. they wanted to audition a lead singer because the lead singer had walked out the week before about something. They weren't he, stroking yeah. his ego enough. And he's like, this is an unacceptable. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a whole other story. I don't know. <clears throat> These guys want me to load in gear. I'm out of here. Yeah, something to do with a set list. And the, he drew the line in the sand. And they wanted to play a certain song for Bruce Allen, who was like the bouncer and co-owner of the club and all that stuff with his other partner, Sam Feldman. And anyway, so... Guess who auditioned for lead vocals? Mike Reno. Correct. There you go. And he was living in Penticton, singing in a band called um, Synergy. Now, wasn't in Mike a drummer originally? Yes. Nice. Now, was he a was was he a kind lead singer that used to play drums, or was he like a Stephen Tallarico that was all over Joey? No. He was nice. Oh, he was, he was kind. It's Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to throw Mike under the bus. So nice. He, he actually sat in for me one night in the club because I had broken my foot or something. And he tried to sing lead from behind the drum kit with the microphone thing. That's tough. He, he, he couldn't, he couldn't pull it off. You know, he did the best he could, but I'd always let Mike come and sit down and he came up with a lot of parts and th things that were really cool when we were writing materials, wow, yeah. you know, writing tunes in the early days. And he would have this idea for a groove and he'd sit down and I just go, you know, rather than telling me, just show me, you know, what you're talking about, the kick and the snare and where to lay the snare and the hi-hat pattern. And, you know, he would do stuff like that. Amazing. Which was great. Yeah. So, you know, it was kind of inspiring, but it was really ironic that he auditioned for that gig and didn't get the gig. So he didn't sing in the River Race. So when Selwyn, the guitar player, left in 75, Paul Dean joined the group in Alberta when we were living up in Edmonton. Gotcha. And so he joined the group and so that we were four piece. And then when the river race ended in late 75, we, uh, for, we left the band and formed Streetheart in Regina. There you go. And then that quickly became Loverboy. Well, Paul and I, Paul left first and I left a year later. In 79, we went out and toured with Rush across the country and did the second album at Le Studio with Manny Charlton producing. And um, I left the following fall in 79. So I came back to Vancouver and the phone rang one day at my girlfriend's place at the time. And it was Mike on the phone. <clears throat> and he said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, nothing, just hanging out here in the rain and in Surrey. And he went, okay, you got this little band together. And I'm sure you know Paul Dean. And I went, yeah. And he said, we got this bass player from Calgary called Vern Wills and this keyboard player named Doug Johnson. And we'd like you to come down and, and try out kind of thing. Yeah. See if you like the songs and the direction we're taking. And I went, cool. So I put my Ludwigs in the ranch wagon of my ex-girlfriends and drove down to practice and ran through all the tunes, Turn Me Loose, Lady of the 80s, Kid Is Hot, all those early tunes. Those were already written? Yeah. Wow. Turn and Me Loose. Yeah. Now, right there is the mark of a musical mind. Like creating a Mona Lisa moment without distracting from the storytelling, the riffs or the vocal. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And I didn't know. I didn't know why I liked you 
in the 80s. I just did. And then now that I'm an overeducated, overanalyzing person, I'm like, listen to this mf -er, man. He's on it. This is great stuff, man. You know what I mean? Great. That, did you guys record with click tracks back then? Was that a thing in 80? No. And it you're recording the tape, right? Correct. And pretty much everybody live on the floor and then would go back and redo vocals and redo the harmonies and redo guitars and so stuff. just trying to get the good feeling drum take yeah which is still the case which with is with everybody live on the floor uh -huh. mike would sing in in a vocal booth so we were all basically playing the tunes live nice. and then keep everything that sounded great and and the basics you know on those old days of two inch reel to reel yep. you know and um Fairburn would come out like like the manager to the pitching mound. So Fairburn, Bruce Fairburn was your producer, and Bob Correct. Rock, a young Bob Rock, was the engineer. Correct. Amazing. Yeah, and so Bob Rock's was 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 engineer at Little Mountain Sound. So we were in Studio A, the big studio where the symphony used to be able to set up and record the Vancouver Symphony. Blah blah blah. So. Fairburn would come out and and he would walk out and we had the the drums, my big baffled, baffled, yeah, with, with plexiglass up in the top so I could see to the control room and see the other guys, yeah, and then everything went to the loading bay and they they microphoned the loading bay with a speaker of the drums coming the drum track so they could mic the splodge, so it was real and not can. Yeah. So, so the drum, and that's how Bob Rock recorded all that early stuff. And you know what was really interesting is like I was going back and I was doing a deep dive starting in 1980 and listening to the evolution of the band. And by and in 1980, the snare drum sounds very smaller. It's much smaller with a lot. It sounds gaffy. A lot of gaff tape, right? It becomes because we're coming out of the 70s. No bottom heads. A lot of gaff tape. Hydraulic heads. By '86. Uh, uh, you know what I mean? I'm like, whoa! I know the Akai sampler and all that stuff. You know the 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 splodge, as Bob called it. You know, and I don't know. Def Leppard really put their mark on that with Mutt Lang. You know, well, you know, loving every minute. Douche, 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 douche. That's Def Leppard. Douche, that, that douche. was written by Mutt Lang. Was that song, your song, that one was written by Mutt Lang? Correct. And because it, it's got the same internal rhythm. Do, do, got, do, do. So yeah. that reappeared in another hit by a little group called Def Leppard. <laughs> yeah. Mutt was, was, the, was the golden child behind Def Leppard and ACDC. And, and Shania. And Shania. Yeah. And all the early stuff. You know, and he had this formula that he liked to work with. And, you know, we jumped on the bandwagon. Yeah. In the mid 80s. No, as a, as you're recording that first record uh, and you're around 28 years old and you're a, you're a great drummer, you're confident, you're hardworking, you're in the studio, you're trying to get these cheaper tracks where you, utterly confident or was there a little thing in the back of your mind don't screw this up man go ahead. we got this you can get this you get three minutes of your life because you're not even 30 yet yeah you know there was a lot of yes you can no you can't yes you can don't mess up yes you can don't mess up yeah. you know devil's advocate you know just mind games going on and you just go for it and you're in the moment and i i'm playing on that big kit and then, and then Fairburn would walk out after a really amazing take and sweat would be running down and my headphones would be falling off. We used to have to gaffer tape my headphones to my head because I'm, I'm drumming so animated, you yes. know, flipping around on that big kit. And he'd come out and he'd go, that was amazing. Now take that and give me, just go for everything. Go and all the drums. Hit everything you got exactly, and God bless him, you know. And and then I would just like take the next track and just like punch it, and then 
just like overplay almost. Would that then, would that would that be the keeper usually? Not necessarily, mm. because what they were trying to do was get Tom Phils because Bob was really good with the razor blade and cutting tape. Because back in those days, you couldn't just copy and paste and and drop in on on a computer. You had to cut takes, uh, you yeah. know, packages, you know, and make sure there's not any leakage and stuff like that. So <laughs> we used to have this gaffer gaffer tape my headphones like you're wearing to my head. Yeah. And, 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 and they made this joke that we should gaffer tape my mouth because I grunted and groaned in the overheads. You could, you could pick it up and they would isolate the overheads and take down all the drums and you'd hear. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, 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 like Keith Jarrett. I, I mean, I do the same thing. I mean, still, yeah, it's crazy. You know, just, just going for it, you know, like just, you know, guttural things yeah. and they would play this back to me or record it, you know, like put it on a cassette, you know, it's like, Oh, you guys are our souls. So that anyway. is, that's amazing. But you were always very adventurous with your Tom feels like, but, yeah. you know, your heritage around and the extreme accuracy really good. I love that you have the three up and the two down. Like I always think it's like a pentatonic scale, you know I mean? It's like I've never, at some yeah. point, I'd like to have the five toms. I'm such a little Ringo Bonham guy, just two to three toms. But it's the five, right. really nice. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of Bonham, you know, <clears throat> this year, we're going out with Sammy Hagar, July and August. Oh, cool. And and, and Jason's going to be on drums with drumming royalty there. And yeah. I've never met Jason. So, you know, we're Sammy and his all star band, Satriani on guitar, Michael Anthony on bass. And it's, it's just going to be amazing. Wow. You know, we're really, really looking forward to that. Uh, July and August with, with, with Sammy. Incredible. Um, I'm not looking forward to what's going to be the hot weather this summer outdoors. And I just watched the weather thing this morning on the, my weather channel app. And it's just, it's going to be even hotter than it was last summer and the summer before. Yeah, global warming is a real thing. Uh, you know, you know what's crazy is that um, for for years and years and years, I would have two gigantic industrial strength fans blowing hot July air on me, and then finally yeah. one day we stole the idea from Sukerman to have an air conditioner. So I've had an air yeah. conditioner for six years, and it makes all the difference in the level of enjoyment I get from the job. Yeah. Now I have one now too, but Brian Hit from REO, um, John Aldridge is his tech. Yeah, <clears throat> he was his tech during that tour, and probably still is. And Jay Dakeman, my drum tech, <clears throat> and John worked a thing out because I overamped one night in St. Louis in in late July, and I I got to catering and I was just like really dizzy. And we were doing only a 45 minute set, but the sun would come down right always facing the stage and we'd hit the set at 730 and just the sun's right in your face. And I'm going for that firecracker set, you know, 45, all the hits and just go, 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 go. And then stop when you're at the end, you know, <laughs> and good night, you know, and I, I barely had time to like drink a water. And so I, Brian and Todd both had their ice machines, their air conditioner uh, blowing on their back. And so they would lend me after that incident in the Midwest somewhere, Kansas or St. Louis, wherever that was, and they would lend it to me after. And then whoever was closing the show, because there wasn't really a clear headliner two years ago. Right. It was REO and Sticks, and they would just – swap going from the second place the second band and, and then the closing band yeah so, you know you know what it's 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 a uh, it makes all the difference and you know who i feel i feel like was the original guy to do that the og was i heard that bunny bunny carlos always had an air conditioner back there yeah yeah, yeah old bunny yeah i miss seeing him uh behind the kit yeah so, and then yeah, when you guys yeah, were out with so rush i bought one last year yeah um, just 
to be able to go out and do the summer with foreigner last last summer uh so yeah that's great yeah chris so, frazier lives here now uh you know yeah. like yeah. 30 minutes from me i never see him you know everybody lives here keith carlock lives in spring hill i went to college with keith never see him it's oh crazy you really have to make the effort to like get people out of their houses these days. And it's harder than ever because I think COVID just created this new thing where it's like, ah, go to a nightclub tonight. No, I'm going to sit here. I'm just going to watch friends. You know, people, yeah. you know what I mean? Get out there too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. But I know, but very musical. And I'm so glad you get to do that. So you guys are doing what? 60 shows a year, that kind of a thing still. Well, with, with the summer packages, the last two years since COVID, it's pushing more like 75, possibly. Nice. Um, That's a good you know, number. On an average year when we're not doing the warm-up summer tour, like to a headliner, um, it's, it was averaging kind of around 60, 65 max, usually really solid, like a, a couple in January – maybe a couple in March, you know, just casino work and stuff like that, you know, yeah. where you're indoors and then you start to go outdoors, you know, in some of the warmer States in like May, <clears throat> stuff like that. County fairs, state fairs, yeah. amphitheaters, uh, indoor theaters, and then, um, you know, a festival or something like that. But since we started up after COVID, we landed um, REO and sticks for 2022 uh, for four months. And that was amazing. Uh, best tour ever. I mean, the camaraderie and uh, of everybody, I mean, just, I mean, Kevin Cronin and, and guys from sticks were like watching the set, like almost every night. Yeah. And, that's and, nice. And I'd come off the stage and just like towel around my neck and like, like my tech would put an ice pack around my neck you know, to try and cool me down or an ice towel that was in the ice cooler. And, and I'd walk off the back of the set, you know, cause timing was everything. It was a 15 minute set change between oh, fast. all three bands. That's oh fast. yeah. 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 So we would finish at court uh, at uh, quarter after eight and the second band would start at eight 30 on the dot. That's a, that's a nice turnaround that's great for the audience because yeah. we have we have big multiple act festivals in cut in the country genre but usually the turnaround between sets is 30 minutes yeah yeah nice. i saw i saw your itinerary um yesterday when i was looking online to see jason's um yeah. and what you're up against this year yeah. and um i saw the, the 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 complete package there and uh that's that's a lot of groups to get so, on and off the stage and a DJ in between each one to keep everybody. Oh Cause it's an, gosh. it's an, it's an ADD world. So everyone's like, let we, it's constant. We need music. Yeah. Move those air me molecules. Um, so we also have a mutual friend in Lee Kelly. I just had Lee on the show. Cause we moved to Nashville together the same time. He's kind of my graduating class it was like me, Jim Riley, Pat McDonald, uh, previously with the Charlie Daniels band and Lee. And we all kind of like found our way together and I'm super proud of him, man. But, but I know that he went out and tech for you before he filled in for you before. So I figured I'd drop his name. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was down for the count, um, with my first hip surgery for two months and wow. he came out and did, I don't know, month and a half or something for me. And, um, I think he knew Mike and Mike's wife who has family in Nashville. She does. And they're all in the entertainment. And I think Lee had done some corporate gigs with Mike, with Kathy singing almost wow. paradise or something like that. Oh yeah. And Lee was, was the, um, the, the drummer, on those things yeah crazy so he, he had played a couple of lover boy tunes so yeah amazing amazing man such a such a, a small world now now your influences um uh, it says here ginger baker billy cobham turns 80 years old today man oh my god today today yesterday or today i've been seeing a lot of posts you're don brewers you're mitch mitchell's god rest his soul keith moon god rest his soul Bobby Columbi, Danny Serafin, man, you're, you're, you're speaking, you're preaching, man. I love all these cats, man. Cause they were, they were yeah, mixing. They, they were my masterclass teachers. 
off of record. Yes. You know, I would have loved to have been able to sit down. But when I saw the original Hendrix and, and, and the opening act, there was three opening acts in 67 when I saw Jimmy with no Redding on bass and Mitch on drums was was Vanilla Fudge went on right before with Carmine. Woo! He, he even had his Red Sparkle Ludwigs back then. And him and Tim Bogart did this drum and bass thing. And I was at the back of the room and it was packed. And I just ran. It was just like, I just, it was like a magnet for me. And I yes. had to just get closer and see what he was doing and the way he was attacking his drums. And and I, I really just wanted that. I wanted to absorb as much as possible, you know? Yeah. The way yeah. that the band played and, and, and the bass and drums were connected in fudge, you know? And then it was unbelievable and the crowd was just like blown away. And then Hendrix came on and he was just kind of, you know, lax, just really laid back. And I think he had gone through some hassle at the border, crossing up from Washington, you know. <laughs> and so. So Vanilla was on fire that night. I mean, Carmine, huge inspiration. Of course, the book, Realistic Rock and yeah. you know, the, the whole thing, the gong, bass drums, the leopard skin shirt, the, you know, the the flavor saver, the, all the stuff, man. You know, and his and his. His brother is such a great drummer too. Oh my God, the stuff with the, uh, you know, um, Vinny. Yeah. Dio. Oh, just fantastic drumming. And and I I got to see and 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 meet Carmine. Yeah, I forgot who he was drumming at, drumming with, in a big stadium back in like '82. And could have yeah. been Ted Nugent. It could have been Ozzy. It was it was Ozzy. Bark at the Moon Tour. And it, it wasn't Tommy. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it I think Carmine did the Bark at the Moon Tour and then Sharon fired him because he was trying to sell too much merch at the mer at the merchandise table. And I'm like, well, what yeah, you can't fault the guy for trying. I mean, I uh, believe me, I can relate, man. Let you know, let's let's we gotta work hard at this drumming thing to put it together, man. But uh but no he Big influence. I had the poster on the wall, the whole thing, man. Carmine is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And we played right. I can't remember who was headlining. Ozzy wasn't the headliner. It was a massive stadium. And I want to say like Rich Stadium in Buffalo or something like that. And See, um, uh, Ozzy wasn't headlining. Hmm. I, I could be wrong. It might have been. We, we went out with, with Foreigner when Lou and, and, and Mick were in the band and um, <clears throat> Dennis was drumming and Mark Rivera on sax. And it was just an unbelievable killer band. And we went out in 82 as support and there was multiple bands, you know, Tesla and the 911 and whoever, whoever, whoever. And then Loverboy and then um, Foreigner. But there was one of those bills like that where Ozzy was on the bill. I'm just trying to think who would have been bigger than Ozzy in 1982. Um, it'll come to us. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's all a blur. Probably not. It is a blur. Uh, Did you journal? I mean, do you think you got a book in you? I always ask everyone because now I'm a man of a certain age. You're a man do, of a certain I'd age. To, I'd have to talk it out, you know, with and do an autobiography to have like just tell stories to somebody. Yes, you, know? you, 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 you need a ghostwriter or a co-writer. Yeah, yeah, I need somebody to like feed me like you've been doing on this podcast. You know, it's like, no, I mean it's it's a so well, is it safe to say that of all the years in the music business, like the seventies were your the the sixties and the seventies are your formative years, and eighties you found massive success and was a springboard 40 years later you're still doing it is it safe to say that the 80s may have been your favorite era in the music business or yes um but going back you say you say my informative years <clears throat> the years i was learning and absorbing from the likes of danny seraphin and and um 
and Michael Shreve from Santana, um, all of the all of those uh, early drummers. And so going back when I was thirteen, my going back to my dad, who was such a big influence and and everything on me, he was he played guitar and harmonica, and his love was country and western. Yeah, pure country. Kitty Wells, Patsy Cline, Hank Snow, Hank Williams, Ray Price. Storytellers. All the original storytellers. Yeah. Cash. Um, I know yeah. I'm leaving. Loretta, the- Patsy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. And those records were spinning all the time at home. So I was learning to play to those records and mom like Tom Jones and a bit more bossa nova, Lena Horne, Pretz Prado, um, Hera Belafonte, uh, Tom Jones, Engelberg, you know, music like that, Blue sure. Eyes, you know, Frank Sinatra, Nancy Sinatra, and all of that kind of stuff was going Crude. on Crude, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there was a Tom Jones live record that my parents had that I played the, the, living daylights out of and wore that LP out on my, on my turntable That's awesome. drumming to that. And whoever was drumming in that band was unbelievable. Um, just fired, you know, just like fired up, you know? Yeah. 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 And so I just, my dad took me to buddy rich when I was 13. So did mine about the same age. High fives, man. Yeah. So he, it was obviously underage in there, but it was a supper club serving food. So I was allowed to go in there and it was the afternoon set. And so we were in there sitting at a table and Buddy came on and doing his thing. And he goes into his solo and he starts this press roll and he's flying around the kit, you know, and (laughs) doing one handed press rolls and shit, you know playing and all this stuff. And these two drunk guys, salesmen had been there all day drinking liquid lunch. And they yes. were sitting right at the front of the stage at this little table. And they're, just, they're completely ignoring what's going on on stage. <laughs> and everybody else in the room was there to see the Buddy Rich big band. And there was a lot of parents with kids, like young drummers. Yeah. Yeah like like myself and so buddy brought the solo down to a press roll and stopped and they were oblivious Uh oh so buddy had his sticks under his arm and he walked to the edge of the stage and he was just standing looking over them and they were oblivious just <laughs> you know you don't know where and i that's pretty good that's, a, that's pretty good man yeah so not bad for a guy who's been sober for 33 years. Oh, my God. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so he he just kind of – he took his sticks together and he wrapped them on the table to get their attention. And then they kind of looked up and they went, oh. And they stopped, you know, their banter. And he just said, loud enough for everybody in the room to hear Everybody in this effing room is here to see me and my band. You guys are a major effing distraction. And the air was just blue. And he went off on these two guys. Awesome. And he said, I suggest you get the F out of here if you're not interested in listening to this music because nobody else can hear what we're doing in the quiet parts, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so the bouncer came over and escorted these two guys out the door. Amazing. Buddy went back and started that press roll and built it up and finished a solo. A one, two, a one, two, three, four, bump, 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 and went into his whatever, Channel One Suite or something like that. Yeah, West Side Story. That has always stayed with me, Rich. And if I was to ever pass on, and I tell that story, I told that story when I was doing clinics 
back in the 90s and stuff, just as an inspirational story to young drummers who are starting out and look for a fire in somebody to, to take, take the baton and get a small piece of it. And the fire was lit in me that day by Buddy Rich. Awesome. And I, I just really wanted to command a band like he commanded and attack the drums and play the drums musically and, and not get in the way of the vocals and not get in the way of other stuff. Pick and choose your holes. Yes. Where, where to shine. Turn me loose. Ah, turn. That, there's a conversation. It, there's a, there's the, there's the conversation right there. You're filling in the cracks between the vocal phrases. And I just heard that song on the radio not but two days ago, and it still sounds great. Going back to that Bob Rock, Mike Fraser, Bruce Fairburn team, and the does. way they recorded all those early tracks, and it still sounds great, you know, it compared to everything else on the radio. And I just go, well, yes, thank you, Bob. You know, and, you know, and it goes so great is that is that I experienced that same thing. My dad took me to a supper club to see Buddy Rich, and the girls were dressed, the waitresses were dressed in like heavy metal, like chain mail and like fishnet stockings and stuff, because it was like eighty four, right? And and he comes out and he starts oh, doing man. a solo and he stops the solo and he goes. Who the fuck booked me in this place? And but then he just continued to rip it up. Then my dad took me to see the Maynard Ferguson Big Band with Ray Brinker. Ray Brinker, now an Angelino drummer, fantastic all around musician. Took me to see um, Chuck Berry play. And Chuck Berry would always hire local musicians. So my drum teacher was the guy that got selected to play with Chuck Berry that night. So I got to see my drum teacher. But you, wow. your really? dad and my dad were the same guy and it make, gives me goosebumps and I could tell you're getting a little emotional and I was getting emotional listening to your story because that's such a special time in someone's life when a, a parent champions their child and is willing to climb a, a, a fire escape to get someone in to, to, to an audition. Yeah, yeah. And that is a figuring out the drums and getting good at the drums and having my parents be so, so that was a very special time it was yeah you know and that still lies with me god bless my old man you know um yeah with just real inspiration back in the day and just pushed me almost pushed me out the door after high school pretty yeah. much like he said he said go do this yeah and then i i, I was rewinding back a little bit if he give you a little bit uh, I shouldn't go on so much about my old man. Um, oh, please do. It's great. Anyway, between grade 11 and grade 12, so go back a year, I had a, a country gig with this Roy Oberson cover band called Larry Branson and Downstream from Vancouver. And we had a gig in Northern BC for a month up there playing in the club with a band house and all that yeah. for the summer months. And I called home. And it was in August because school started after Labor Day in Vancouver, in, 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 in British Columbia, in Canada. So I called and got my mom on the phone. And I said, hey, mom. No, I got my dad on the phone first. And I said, hey, can you guys register me for grade 12? And my old man said, no goddamn way. You know, French Canadian kind of. Did setting. he speak? Did he speak French? He spoke really good French, but we grew up on the West Coast, mm. where he met my mom in Calgary, and so all his relatives were in Quebec. So he didn't have a lot of reason to speak French in on the West Coast in Vancouver gotcha. with the family growing up. So he. He only cussed in French when he would hit <laughs> thumb or with a hammer or something working in his tool shop, whatever. So, you know, he, what was the story I was telling? Sorry. No. Oh, you were telling me, uh, I should have, I should have interrupted you about the French language thing, but, um, yeah, your old man. Was doing oh we were talking about you know how great they were to us and supportive and oh, he oh, kind oh, of kicked oh, you out the door. Yeah 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 yeah. So he 
he um i said put mom on the phone he, he what he said before he, before i said that was he said you're going to stay out there your road the road and your drums is your education i'm not signing you up for grade 12 and i said put mom on the phone so mom came on and i said you just heard what dad just said right he doesn't want me coming back for grade 12 and he said and she said yeah and I said, will you register me for grade 12? And she said, sure, I will. And my kid sister, Lisa, was starting grade eight. It was a big high school and um, like over 2000 student population. Wow. I was concerned for her and I wanted to finish all my track and field and sports and stuff. I wasn't a great student, you know, C, C minus D, blah, 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 always looking out the window, thinking of sports and music you're a, you're a dreamer like luke skywalker yeah, yeah yeah that'll that'll go with the pisces so yeah. yeah so i ended up getting registered and i came back for grade 12 but that just gives you an idea about how dedicated the old man one he just wanted me out to live his dream you know to be I mean, that's teacher. incredible he didn't even want you to finish high school he was ready for you to go do it yeah that's crazy yeah so basically by grade 12, when he got that audition idea, he basically pushed me out the door and said, you know, here you go, kid, go make a life for yourself. So when you guys won the six Juno awards, which is like the, uh, the equivalent to the Grammys. Yeah. That had to be a big night. It was six for six. Nobody's ever been nominated for six and won all six in a single night like that. Yeah, I think you said uh, you won for best group, best band, best writer, best producer, best single, and best engineer. Correct. Wow. And so... Uh, People in Toronto were booing us at the end by the time we got to the fifth and sixth because they wanted their local bands like Rush and, 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 and you know, Kim Mitchell and stuff to, to win something else, you know, rather than, oh, here we are again, you know, and then we now go did, back. To the did you guys take turns... Um, doing little acceptance speeches, or was there always just a point man that did that, that spoke on behalf of the band? Uh, a little bit of both. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> my dad was always like, "I can't wait to see you on the Grammy stage." Now I played the Grammys, but as a side man, I've never been able to go up there and go, I, "Yo, Adrian, I did it." You know what I mean? It's it's a different thing, but you know exactly yeah yeah so you know there was a bunch of award shows that we went to and ironically enough uh we were inducted into the canadian canadian music hall of fame many right. years ago and the inductee was bob rock but it was in vancouver at the pacific coliseum rather than back east so it was just really timely and and all that good stuff so you know, we have that to, to think about and to, th to think, you know, that. And then um, last year, June, we were inducted into the Con uh, British Columbia Entertainment Walk of Fame in Vancouver in June. And then in September, we were inducted into the Canadian Walk of Fame in Toronto, but only Mike and Paul went. And um, we had a gig the next day, and the weather back east was really, really bad. And they got stuck in New Jersey trying to fly back from Toronto to New Jersey to Charlotte. And wow. we had a gig the next day in Hickory with, with Night Ranger at a casino, and we never ended up playing. Wow. Night Ranger ended up doing a, a full set, thank wow. goodness. So, anyway. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, the other thing that just comes to mind that I wanted to mention was it seems like you're an incredibly – uh, loyal endorser forever oh, yeah. with Yamaha drums, forever with Zildjian cymbals. Yeah. Um, Very loyal. I'm going to get in trouble. Like I'm a longtime DW endorser, but they know, and I'm just on a roll here where I'm having a million Yamaha artists. It's some great drums. Great drums. Yeah. I, and so how long I, have you been there? 30 I, years? I signed in 91. Yeah. So, 33 years. Nice. And I signed with Zildjian in 81. Um, so that's 43 years. 
There you go. And Lenny Demuzio signed me. Uh, nice. Originally, he was, he was a character, right? He was like, oh, "Hey, yeah. hey, kid, hey, hey we, we, kid. we want it's you to try this new Z crash, okay? Yeah, it's, hey. it's the bomb." You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I read his book and everything too. You know. Are you a Remo guy? Yes. Yeah. What? Well, and there, there you go. They, you know, it's. I've been, uh, I've been Remo for life. And, I've been uh, I've been with Remo since 1995. Yeah. Yeah. I've tried all the other companies, but I, I, I just think Remo's my sound and it's the soundtrack of my life of of all those early drummers we were speaking about sure. earlier in the program. You know, it, yeah. it's just it's the sound for me. And anyway. Me too. I I I'm playing Vader uh drumsticks. Nice since 94 or 95 early on yeah yep and in in the beginning it was uh collateral uh and i played these great big 2b nylon tips oh the re the oh yeah because you're a re you are a nylon tip guy this is a rare thing nowadays yeah yeah um so what's the appeal there the brightness on the symbols correct on That's the rod right. nice but here's the deal i don't hear a lot of ride in lover boy music am i crazy or what there's a lot of bell, more bell, but in songs like Take Me to the Top, especially live, you know, the the Oh yeah, it's like dung did got the ding ding go dung did got um got did get you kind of get on that during that section, right, of that song? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um and Lady of the Eighties has that kind of paradiddle-ish thing with the bell and the snare. Yeah. It, you know and but take me to the top is expanded live now where uh -huh. we have a sax solo going into a keyboard solo so it's a doug johnson feature in the in the kind of about halfway through the tune which is nice and it, it just drops down to like real quiet and i get to play like the ride like kind of almost i won't say it jazzy but just like ride and 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 I've always been a nylon tip guy yeah. since the beginning. And I just like the extra ping and the top end. So I, I started with, with Colato, uh, the two Bs. And then I, I did about a five or six year stint with Vic Firth. And then I went um, to Zildjian for a little while when they were making uh, drumsticks. And uh, Johnny D was, was shipping me out sticks. And then I, I jumped to Vader. Chad, I, uh, yeah, he, Chad, yeah, yeah, and Chad, and yeah. they take really good care of me, and um, as they should, yeah, and I, <laughs> I, I love the 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 five B and um, nylon tip, and it's just a regular uh, five B natural hickory stick, yep. and I don't have them do anything special, you know, to them. They're not mm -hmm. a signature stick, but I get my my signature and the band logo on them, and so they stamp them. Beautiful. Which is cool. Yeah, we're both five B guys, man. It's perfect for the way you know we play. Five A just seems like we're going to go through a lot of these. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, on those years when the band stopped playing between late eighty nine and um, ninety four or ninety three, the group just kind of parked the old Chevy in the garage, put it up on blocks. It wasn't like a bitter breakup. Guys just wanted to do different things in life, solo records, write differently, work with different people. Sure. Whatever, go on a holiday, spend money, get divorced, get married, you know, whatever, you know, start a family. So there was a break there. And that was a good 10 years of, of going um, hard, especially from like 80 to, you know, 89. Um, supporting five studio records and yeah, a couple of greatest hits, you know. So guys just wanted to, you know, do their own thing. And I played on Mike's first solo record, the whole the whole record. He just hired me to come in. And I played on Paul's solo stuff. And, um, and did you I play on the big Tom, Tom Cochran song? I did not. Mickey Curry. Oh, it's Mickey. Okay. Played on Mad Mad World down in Memphis with okay. Joe Hardy. Oh yeah, okay. And and Spider Ken Seneve, our bass player, 
was was with Tom then. He was in the Red Rider. Um, so he recorded on that track. So that okay. was all Nicky on the whole album. Brilliant. Good friend and and great drummer. I mean I, I love Mickey. He was on the show yeah, and I I, I just I just love that he's did. a he grew up in Guilford, Connecticut and he still lives yeah. in Guilford, Connecticut. <laughs> yeah. All the kids with all the notes, you know, and, and Jonathan Wolfson, our management, uh has Hall and Oates now, the new wow. Hall and Oates. And you know what's so and, great is that Hall and Oates is they called it a quits, man. Yeah. That's so crazy to think. But we still have Brooks and Dunn. It's the it's the country the Hall and Oates. And then the other thing that has happened recently that I cannot even believe because you mentioned saxophone. Can you believe we lost David Sanborn, man? The greatest, one of the greatest saxophone tones of yeah. instantly recognizable, man. A, a big fan. Yeah. I was a big fan, man. Huge um loss. What was the cowbell on? Ding, 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 blap. Hang on. You got it? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Matt is in his studio and he's going to, there it is. It's a, it's a silver. I don't know what the brand is, but it's covered in duct tape. It's, it's an LP called a deluxe and they don't make it anymore. Don't and get rid of that. It's it. No. And it's got the old brace and it's been welded a million freaking times. It's Are you still it. playing it live or no? It's now it's like a museum piece. No, no it's a museum piece now. It's yeah. got all the old gaffer on it. You know, like, I've had many cowboys that look like that because that's not even gaffer. That's um, that's just electrical tape, I think. Right. Which is extra gaffer sticky. Tape. Just gaffer tape. Oh, it's yeah. gaffer tape. Yeah, man. Yeah, so yeah. Usually, usually we'll end up things with the, the, the fave five. And um, I usually like to ask people what their favorite um, color is. I played LP for a long time um, until 2022 when I met Mark Petroselli, who's Todd Zuckerman's drum tech. Yes. He also works with Toka. And and, and Grover now, uh, which is a uh, uh, TM uh, RM, RMI music. Right. They, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. So he came to me just in a relaxed session after you know, after our sound check and, and, and that break before we would hit the stage, you know, right, right around dinner and, and catering and all that. And he said, you know, just, I'm a big fan, blah, 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 you know, and, and I just wanted to talk to you and there's no pressure that would you consider ever trying an, a different cowbell? And I went, actually funny that you ask because I've been, we've been trying, including management, to get a hold of LP for almost two years now with no response. What? I can just get you the email address. I'm an LP guy. So it just seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. Weird. So I said, your timing couldn't be better. And so he laid on their Timbali bell, which was white with a black logo on the sides. And... I put it up for sound check and loved it. So now you're a Toka guy. Now I'm a Toka guy. There you go. Awesome, man. They're and sending me these nice white um, cowbells, and um, I'm a happy camper. And it, it actually plays easier, especially in lucky ones with the 16th with one did hand. Did, 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 did. Yeah, that's awesome, man. <laughs> so great. Yeah. Oh, okay, so hey, I was going to ask you, what's your favorite color? black come on we're both wearing black it's yep. classic it never goes out of style darth vader approved what about you talking um, about drums I, almost every drum set i've ever had in my entire life is either black or red or black matte or black panel black or black sparkle or red sparkle or black and red sparkle you know it's i'm not a yellow drum guy i'm never i'm never gonna have lime green drums i'm more of like a solid color guy yeah, right. I tend to swing towards um, sparkle drum kits. Hmm. I don't. I don't know if that's just <clears throat> being really retro. My first Yamaha kit in '91 was piano black, recording custom with Rock Tour custom bass drums, yep. twenty-two by eighteen long yeah. with Cochrane for those three years. I drummed with him. 
And then I sold the drum kit uh, to a recording studio in North Vancouver, Baker Street Sound, because um, I was doing a record there and I just left them set up and um, on our downtime on those four years that we weren't working with Loverboy. And I just left the kit with them and they ended up going, wow, we love this drum kit. And uh, now it's the house kit. It's still there a bit. It, it, it probably is. So, <clears throat> and then, you know, Yamaha every four years would send me another kit and, you know, I've done my best to collect them and, you know, sell them and, and, you know, after four years or whatever. So my, my years in Canada, so I moved to the United States in 2008 ah. to Southern California. And oh, okay. the following year in 2009, I jumped on the Yamaha American roster. So Greg Crane out in California mm -hmm. is, is my rep with Yamaha. Great. And um, I'm playing hybrid maples now. Beautiful. And, and the kit that I toured last year and the previous year with REO and Sticks, last year with Foreigner, was my orange sparkled hybrids. 10, 12, 13, 16, 18 two 22s nice the, the left 22 is a dummy and i i play a slave pedal yamaha's pedal on the right bass drum beautiful and a side snare and i i managed to um when they were still making signature snare drums i i i used the side snare drum as it snares off like a timbali sound um yeah what I is have, what does you sick and end call that it's like the the reggae drum he's got on the side there yeah I yeah. used uh, 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 David Garibaldi, the blue uh, steel or yeah. brass drum. It's only about three inches deep. And now, how I, long? How long were you in Southern California? Four years. Isn't it I, a mag Isn't it a magical place? Sunny and seventy every day. Yes. I I I I, I, I was. You pay. You pay. You pay for that magic. You, you pay. Absolutely. You pay more than ever. You pay more than ever. So I went back and forth between L.A. and Nashville for. 10 years but six years very aggressively and um it it took a lot of my money but it sure was fun you yeah know? yeah really great where were you where were you are you an orange county guy were you a silver orange Lake county guy? uh living in tustin for four years okay um went down for uh ballet training for um our son and daughter okay and uh there was a russian academy down in Mission Viejo. <clears throat> and uh, so we went down for that. And our son was turning 14 at the time and he needed male tutorship. Sure. And proper body building and, and weightlifting for ballet for the stage, not yeah. look like a sprinter or a football player or a weightlifter, you know. And the Russians teach the men how to partner and hold a woman like up on their arm and make it look effort, effortlessly. Yeah. So that's in, some incredible strength. Okay. So graceful you know, strength, graceful strength, graceful exactly. strength. And, what? um, yeah, that was in, in imperative that, yeah, get that kind of training. So what do you, what do you do? So you're a walker, you hit the, you just walk every day for your, for your health and fitness. Uh, as much as I can. Yeah. I, I have a trainer here at a, a fitness center here in Rex, uh, in here in Raleigh called Rex Wellness. Nice. Um, and I'm seeing him tomorrow and uh, just kind of book training sessions, like a little six pack and go there and work on my stamina. And, and we've had a, a pretty quiet fall, winter and spring. Um, Mike had an ankle replacement surgery last November, middle of November last year and that's a, that's a tough rehab mm. you know for him um and i know because i've had two hips and um you know coming back because that's such a weight bearing joint and it's it's going to take some time so we've been trying to stay off the off the stage and and let mike just do his thing and and rest and and get ready to rock this 2024 out I'm you know? excited. I'm excited for you guys. We're getting ready to fight. I mean, we've been flirting, you know, press, award shows, casinos, festivals, 
But yeah. then we're going to get ready to do the big Live Nation tour and go boom, boom, boom in a very compressed period of time, yeah. which which I love. Um, but it's so funny. I, what I what my band calls it, we call it surgery season. So n- late November to early February is surgery season. So in the voice of the guy that does um, behind the music, as the band prepared for the 2024 tour, they were easing into surgery season. Yeah, it's like exactly like we get all of our repairing and gluing together done. Yeah. At that time of year. Go see the doctor, the dermatologist, the dentist, the mechanic, you all know, of all the, of it. The trainer, go do all this stuff because when you come off that kind of grueling tour, yeah, you're just knackered and you're beat up, especially guys like at our age. You're you're in, in your forties, thank goodness, you know, and you guys are still rocking it big, big, big time as long as you've been there, you know, yeah. and we admire that. But you know, the bands like REO, you know, and and Styx and Foreigner, you know, like you know, everybody's out there trucking and rolling and and going down the road and doing great business. And that fan base that was available after the two years of pretty much dryness of COVID, some bands went out in 2021 and kind of tiptoed around and Night Ranger and a few few bands went out. But, you know, it was it was a volatile atmosphere out there. Yeah. And, it, you know, the last thing you wanted to do, promoters were really nervous because they booked a string of dates and then the band would get COVID and then everybody would be off the road, you know, yeah. and – you know, all the tour buses and stuff like that, like drivers and th- that whole base to put a put a tour on and audio and 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 uh, lighting companies. You know, I mean, when we went to start up in uh, for those four months, start uh, June, July, August and September with REO and Sticks two years ago, we couldn't find a tour bus for months and months and months yeah. because all the tour bus companies bailed out during COVID and all they lost all their drivers who were driving for FedEx or UPS or just like being at home, you know, yeah. and uh, they sold all their stock. So there was hardly any buses to pick from. That's crazy. It's crazy. But live music is back and it's better than ever. Yeah. Not so much in nightclubs, but in big venues, we're back. Yeah, the, the fan base was just rabid. Like when we hit the stage like that June, you know, it was just packed houses every night for four months with our own sticks yeah. and every night with foreigner last summer, July and August. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. yep. I tell you what, Matt, this has been such a thrill. It's you're such a great guy. It's such a great musician. And I appreciate the inspiration over the years. And, um, I will consider you a friend, man, and I'm putting it on the to-do list to us for to all connect. We can get together with Chris Cohen. You smoke cigars or anything? We can get together and smoke a cigar. Uh, so no, watch the sunset. He, something. You no, know, Chris. Yeah, you know what? Chris is my other good friend here, and and when we hang up, I got to send him a text and and say hello because I kind of lost track, you know, with him. We usually get together for a lunch at La Farm Bakery or something and meet up over in Cary. You yeah. know, spend like two hours talking like this, you know. Well, we'll do it. We'll do it. Well, all three of us will do it and we'll it will close the place down. Be, yeah. All be right. Cra- be crazy. Well, thank you so much. And hey, if somebody wants to ask you a question, they want to follow your career, they want to reach out. What's the best way that people find you on the on the web? You got a dot com or something? I don't. Um well I've, good for you. <laughs> I've been off, the, off the grid, off social media for five years. Uh-huh. Um just for personal reasons. Gotcha. Um, stuff that just became yeah. arduous out there for me. And I just kind of haven't gone there. But well, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just. Loverboy, loverboyband.com. There's okay. lots of uh, uh, um, Instagram and Facebook and all of that. You, L- you can track me down through there. Loverboyband.com. Correct. Not Amazing. Loverboy.com because you, you don't want to go there because we didn't get that handle when everybody was grabbing the dot coms way back when. Oh and my God. It's a porn site. Went, 
that went to a porn site in San Francisco. You know? <laughs> That's really, really funny. Oh, my God. That is crazy. Matt, thank you so much for your time, buddy. Really appreciate it, man. Thanks, brother. God, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, the Matt Frenette, uh award-winning uh, drummer from Loverboy. And we appreciate you guys tuning in. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And until next time, see you then. Thanks, Matt. Yep. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.